It is seven o'clock on a Sunday night, and you know what that means. It's Topical Starts right now. A very good evening to you, South Africa and those watching around the world. My name is Blaine Herman and this is Ed's Topical, a digital audience with us tonight. They are joining us from the politics and law faculties of the Northwest University, Rhodes University, uh, University of Pretoria and the Twana University of Technology, among others, right? Looking forward to their questions for our guests in a short while. Look, this democracy won't work if we don't have an informed citizenry. That's why we're taking the show on the road. Elections 360, starting in just two weeks time, Sakina and I are heading to certain parts of the country. Bags are almost packed. Definitely looking forward to the engagements. Tonight's hot topic, 82 objections in relation to candidates nominated by 21 political parties. That is what the Independent Electoral Commission received, right? Section 47 and 106 of the Constitution. Important, why? It sets out the eligibility criteria and qualification for the National Assembly and Provincial Legislature. Now, I'll get to that in a short while. I'll give you more detail. We'll put it up in the magic wall, get Natasha Piri, politics uh, reporter, to explain it in more detail. But I'll tear it up for you, right? A total of 31 objections implicating eight candidates, alleging that candidates were not qualified owing to criminal records, and or convictions. Now, the Commission dismissed objections in relation to seven candidates and sustained one objection. And this relates to former President Jacob Zuma. Now, part of the exception list is any person who was convicted of an offence and sentenced to more than 12 years imprisonment without the option of a fine. Now, this disqualification ends five years after, after the sentence has been completed. Important. Put a note on that. We'll discuss. The aim, look, tonight's program is aimed at giving you a better understanding of an important aspect of the electoral process and the implications thereof, which leads us to the question of the week. And we're asking you, what's your opinion with regards to the IEC's decision to uphold objections barring former President Jacob Zuma's nomination to Parliament? Let us know at its topical SABC. Come, let's walk and talk. Now, I just want to clarify, and this is something that the IEC has clarified, that the issue is not with the party that nominated the former president. It is with the former president, Mr. Jacob Zuma. So, it does not mean that the MK party is disqualified. Important to note, I will discuss that in a short while as well. Share your thoughts with us at its topical SABC perspective. Come now. All right, let's get straight to it. My guest tonight to help me explain this, as I mentioned at the top, uh, SABC News politics reporter, Natasha Piri. She joins me now live. Natasha, good to have you on the program. It's, it's a busy, busy day, busy Easter. Election Happy season. Easter, by the way. Thank you, likewise. <laughs> we prime in the middle of it. So this is part of the process that mm -hmm. we've learned more over the week, the criteria for disqualification of candidates. Mm -hmm. What stands out for you? I think what you've been yeah. emphasizing on the issue of um, the former president, Jacob Zuma, the conviction, the sentencing of over 12 months of mm. imprisonment. But I think, Blaine, what's important to highlight is that the IEC had said that, listen, it's not about former president Jacob mm. Zuma. As you know, that there were other objections right. that were actually raised, eight uh, to be in total. But of course, the IEC had to do everything by the book, meaning everything by the constitution. And then the argument also comes up about Gaten McKenzie. Right. Remember, he was convicted of robbery years ago yeah. but of course he was um, um, exonerated because there is a rule uh, according to the constitution of which the IC um, actually used the disqualification ends after five years after the sentence has been completed right. this um, this ground of disqualification does not extend to persons who are yet to be sentenced and those while sentenced are yet to exhaust appeal mechanisms available to them mm. so of course he's exonerated of this um, um, this very process because of the five years exactly that because have, of the five left. years 
Talk to us about this. Many people are unclear as to what is an unrehabilitated insolvent. What does that all mean? Well, unrehabilitated persons, mm. um, of course, like you've also indicated, um, issues of declared to be of yeah. unsound mind by South African courts. Um, so these are just some of the, the, the right. issues um, that actually the, um, the IEC, I beg your pardon, had actually highlighted um, during um, that briefing that we actually had on um, Thursday. Right. So this is some of the trends mm -hmm. and stats that were picked up. So no objections with regards to unrehabilitated insolvents, the issue of unsound mind, uh, the issue of criminal records. Yes. This is where we, we, we're jumping in. Definitely. Um, dismissing seven candidates, and we know who this is. Yes. That is the former president, uh, Jacob Zuma. Like you've correctly said, um, it doesn't disqualify the party. Right. Right. It just disqualifies him. And I was on the phone um, today with the party's interim spokesperson, mm. Lamulon Lela. He had said that um, the party is actually planning to go to the electoral court um, on the second. Remember the, the final cut right. off date. So they the are second. appealing. They right. will be appealing the decision. And of course, any other party that is disgruntled, not only in regards to issues around the objections, but we were there at the IEC on Thursday. Thursday and there's a rise, um, a rise South Africa, beg your pardon, yeah. that is Mpo Dagada's party. They are complaining and they are saying that they were unlawfully removed from the candidate, the provisional candidate list mm. that was published on the 26th and on the 27th. It's not only them, a number of parties are complaining, saying that, um, you know, they were unlawfully mm. removed from those lists. So any other party, um, and the IEC is also imploring them to say, if you've got evidence of that, right. go to the electoral court. The cutoff date is Tuesday, the 2nd of April. And and of course, remember, the electoral court will come back with a decision on the 9th of April. Right. The 10th of April is a very important date as well, where the IEC will come back with the final list of political parties that will then comprise of the ballot box. Right. Yes. So also another date that's important to note the... Oh, let's get that. This is, becomes important yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Look, the code of conduct, it's in play already. Mm -hmm. It happens in the terms of the date of proclamation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but talk to us about how important this is in terms of everybody, uh, you know, adhering to the rules that is stipulated in this code of conduct. So um, I think the IEC has now updated the dates. It's right. actually on the 5th of April, which is this I coming see. Thursday. Okay. And of course, it's SABC Fifth. News. We will be covering this for you very extensively. Right. So Blaine, all these political parties will be there yeah. signing the pledge and signing the code of conduct. Yeah. And remember, when you sign the code of conduct, you are going to be held accountable right. as a political party. Time and time again, we've been hearing um, political parties somewhat trying to incite violence, yeah. some are trying to cast doubts and aspersions on the work of the IEC. And the IEC is saying that we are not going to tolerate that. If you don't toe the line, mm. you'll be taken to the electoral court. So this is a very important day. And it kind of gives you a sense mm. of which political parties will then be contesting in this um, national right. and provincial elections. But also, Blaine, I also want to take you back to the issue. I mean, there's an issue that's been dawning our headlines this past week. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been seeing the ANC and the MK in court. We've yes. been seeing the issue of the trademarks and the logos. There's a story um, that our colleague, Debojo Pachedi, actually mm. um, covered uh, in the Northwest. So this is one of the parties that will be taking the IEC to the electoral court. Um, so they had formed their party as the Economic Liberators Forum. Right. which had actually held similarities to the EFF. Same logo, same color. The EFF quickly jumped on, on this and, of course, objected um, to its registration. Right. The party was then deregistered and now is now re-registered re Sorry, as the ELF uh, of South Africa. Why? Yes. Important story. We will stay on top of that. Natasha Piri, thank you so much thank you. for your better mind on the subject. Look, it's important. These dates are important. Natasha clarified that it's... Uh, in terms of the pledge, it's no longer happening on the 4th, it's happening on the 5th of April. So we will keep you up to date with the very latest with regards to all these important dates. This is another important date, the 10th of April, the final compilation of the parties and candidates as well. All right, so let's get your take on this. We went out, as we do every week, for our word on the street feature to get your opinion on tonight's topic. This is what you had to say. He was just one of many others that were being objected to. It's not right. I, I don't think people with criminal records should be in government because they are like the head boy. You should look up to these people. 
it's an individual case, case study. It's like, I'll do without this person and then the sins of this person, they're too great to, to forgive. Are you guilty forever if you've done a crime? It's all these kind of questions where as humans now we kind of have to figure out. But at the same time, we don't have the time because we are a nation. We need electricity, we need water, we need... This goes on, yeah. I'd like to think that the person who is governing our country is someone who hasn't had a criminal record in the past. Obviously we all make mistakes and we can all learn from our mistakes, that's also true. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's a very negative thing that that's what's happened. I'm not a huge Jacob Zuma fan, but um, it just depends what, you know, if you're going to do it, then do it for everybody. You can't do it for one person. Um, that's the problem with the country is there's no accountability. So it's just like that, you know, for some people get punished for crime and other people don't. I do think that if you have a criminal record, uh, it, it makes it a bit difficult for the ordinary civilian to entrust anything. If prisoners can vote, then they can run for president. Um, but if prisoners can't vote in this country, I think maybe we just exclude him. You know, at least give us one election cycle without having to worry too much. I think it's a fair thing um, in a country that we try to promote no crime, we want a safe country. I think we need to have leaders that um, resemble a country that we're, that's not promoting crime. I don't know if I subscribe to the idea that we can disqualify people from leadership because of criminal past. I think it depends on what the crime is. I don't know, dude. I'm not a legislator. For me, I just want electricity and, you know, black people to enjoy life and land. That's all I want, land. <laughs>All right, we really appreciate your thoughts on this matter. Let's get straight into the discussions. We've lined up a number of guests as well. I want to look at the story from a political point of view as well as a legal point of view. Get your sound understanding with regards to the process. And we've lined up a number of guests as well. Melusi Kulu, legal analyst from Donda Attorneys, joins us. Jolene Stein Kotze, a chief research specialist at Human Science Research Council, as well as Professor Bekim Gomezulu, uh, director of the Center for the Advancement of Non Racialism and Democracy at the Nelson Mandela University. Thank you so much for joining us. Also, our digital audience here, as well, I mentioned at the top from the various uh, higher learning institutions that they're from. Please raise your hands uh, if you have any questions for our guests. We'll get straight to you in a short while. All right, uh, Mr. Kolu, maybe to you first, and let's get a, a legal basis or legal understanding of what we're talking about here. In terms of the commission, when they, they consider objections, they, they're looking at section 30 of the Electoral Act, right? But they also read it with two areas of the Constitution, namely section 47 and 106 of the Constitution. Talk to us uh, about these constitutional provisions. Help us understand it. Um, firstly, good evening to you, uh, Lane, and good evening to the fellow guests and to the viewers at home. Thank you for having me. Uh, firstly, I will focus on section 47, which states that if it happens that um, the, you, you, you need to qualify, you need to be eligible to be a part of the National Assembly. There are certain instances where you don't qualify. So the, the main one that I'll talk about, uh, I'll just go straight to section 47, subsection 1, paragraph E, that says if you have, as you've stated before, if you have a, a sentence of 12 months or more, um, you are not eligible to be part of the National Assembly. Right. which is what is happening with the former president. He has a sentence from, if you remember, from June 2021, where he was given a sentence of, of 15 months. So what happens now is that if he's in that situation, he's not eligible to be part of the National Assembly. Same as Section 106, Subsection 1, Paragraph E, which is part of um, the section that talks about being part of the provincial legislature. Right. Now, what I found interesting is the fact that Obviously, the MK might have anticipated that this might happen, but the question is what 
what what what can they do about it? Mm. Because if you had the interview that was done by the commissioner, she stated very clearly that in any case, before anything happens, the person who's part of the list to be candidate, in terms of section 27, subsection um, 2, paragraph C, you must sign on the candidate uh, as, a, as an acceptance form right. that says that you com you qualify. So you qualify in terms of the constitution. So that is that the, the challenge that I think the president has. Right. So part of being a candidate is signing that acceptance form, and that form confirms that you are eligible to be a member of parliament, right? Yes, in right. terms of section 47 and, and 106. Right. Before, before we look at the politics of this whole thing, in, so we understand now from reporting from Natasha Piri that there is possibly going to be an appeal. Uh, prospects, sir, when you look at this, uh, good or bad in terms of success? Well, if I look at it objectively in terms of the law, I, I, don't, I don't see how they'll succeed. The only way they have is a technical approach, uh, Blaine, where they, they've been consistently saying, I've just tried to read uh, articles that I could find, but they've been consistently saying as MK that they will do whatever they can, even if it means changing the constitution. Now, for you to change the constitution as a party, you must have a two-thirds majority, and in terms of section 74, subsection 1, mm. and to 3 of the constitution. So that is what they need to do. But and that's a really high mark. A, 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 it's, a, it's a high mark, but I'm not a numbers person, and I'm just focusing on the law. Uh, Jolene Kotzer, if it is clear in terms of the law um, about the, the conviction, etc., and the sentence, uh, then why continue? Why does the MK party continue uh, with Mr. Zuma on the parliamentary list? Is it a case of they did not know, or... Is there another strategy at play here? You know, I think that is a it's, it's a very interesting question. And I think it really brings us to the point where we do need to start looking at what are some of the uh, political and democratic values that would drive our political elites. Um, bearing in mind, uh, you know, the Constitution provides us with a certain institutional framework. That institutional framework gives us the rules by which the various actors need to engage um, in their, their political game, if mm. one will. Um, if there is, uh, as was noted earlier, kind of saying, no, but we need to change the rules of the game because this is the person we want to get into parliament. Um, my question then becomes around the respect for institutional integrity and the respect for, for those constitutional rules that have to guide the behavior of political elites within those institutions. And I think it's also quite crucial to bear in mind, this is our first um, general election that we would have after a very difficult period with COVID, after some very difficult questions that have come up mm. on institutional integrity, most notably through the findings of the Zonda Commission. Um, so I think from a, a political level, for me, those questions around institutional integrity are going to become quite important. Uh, Prof. Gomezulu, same question to you. If the law is clear, why continue with Mr. Zuma on the list? Uh, Blaine, thank you very much for the question. You, you know, there is more to this than it meets the eye. I, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Koro that in terms of law, it seems pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But as I said, there is more to it than it meets the eye. Ask yourself the very first question, how did uh, the Constitutional Court arrive to the 15 months? That's where things started going wrong. In fact, they started, things started going wrong with the Zondo himself. Because Zondo is one person who created us these problems in many ways. One, when uh, the former president appeared before him, he was not treated like any other. I remember having a series of interviews on this one. One of the callers uh, said, no, but Gomez is wrong because mm. uh, uh, Zuma cannot be treated like all other witnesses, uh, all other witnesses because uh, he's, he's been charged. I said, no, no one has been charged. If you appear before the commission, Mr. Kuru will confirm this. There is a difference between a commission of an inquiry and a court of law. Mm. A commission of an inquiry is there to just get facts. So that's where things went wrong. 
then as if that was not enough, when the issue went straight to the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Court did not apply its mind. It just um, it took this case as presented by Zondo, who was part of the Constitutional Court anyway, would have expected the outcome. Then, of course, uh, there was no trial that ever took place there. And then uh, the judgment that was delivered by Sisi Kambembe was riddled with emotions. So in other words, part of it was based in law, but the, the bulk of it was based on emotions. Mm -hmm. I remember having interviews with some of your colleagues playing, saying that uh, if you are a judge, more especially the constitutional court, we have to apply the law to the letter simply because that is the apex court of the land. Mm -hmm. Whatever mistake you make at that level will come back to haunt us. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we cannot blame the IEC, but the blame should go back to the Zondo Commission and should go back to Sisi Kambembe and his company, those who deliver the judgment, which, as I say, was riddled with emotions. And then you had an option whether to give him a suspended sentence or, or fi find him guilty in absentia like they did, but then you give him an option of a fine, we wouldn't yeah. be here. But he went straight for straight 15 months. When Zondo himself had suggested two years. Where did he get it from? I don't know, maybe there are different schools of law, Mr. Kulu can assist me here. Right. Here are lawyers who are supposed to know the law, but they seem to be found wanting at that point, and that is why we're here. So, given that we are here, what, what, what do you think is the end game uh, in terms of the state of play? No, the MK, like any other political party, and like any other individual, we have to exhaust all options available. Mm. In this case, they are allowed to appeal this uh, a, a, a decision by the 2nd of April, which is on Tuesday. And then, of course, the Electoral Court will make a pronouncement by the 9th uh, of, um, uh, of, of April. Right. So they are basically exhausting the law, as should be the case, as anyone else is entitled to. So there is nothing wrong with them doing that. And then let the Electoral Court make the final determination. Right. Mr. Kulu, uh, is there anything in law that prevents the MK party from using... Uh, Mr. Zuma's image on posters, etc., in terms of their campaigns? I think in terms of uh, the posters and so forth, it won't be a problem. The only issue will be, uh, obviously, on the, on the ballot paper. I'm not too sure about that, because we have a similar situation with the IFP, if you followed it, uh, even before Obama uh, Mamosuti passed away, uh, he, they, they were actually using him on their t-shirts and also on the poster so it might be the same thing where we see him playing a role outside of uh, obviously leading in the parliament and also in, in in the provincial legislature as we are dealing with it now right. uh, but also i think what the uh, Lara has stated or as much as we we see that there's no other way but it's very serious to note that we we'll have not been here if the law was applied correctly because if you go to section 35 subsection 3 paragraph D and, and E, it says uh, you have a right to be present during your trial. So in this case, you know, Mshuloz was not present, but we are here now and, you know, we can't go back, but it's just a question mark and a big elephant in the room. But in any case, we will hear from the MP party what they will right. do about all the scenarios that we are discussing today. Jolene Stenkot, so just to button up the point, how important is Jacob Zuma's continued visible, visible association with the MK party for the party's success in this election? You know, I think um, we have to bear in mind that uh, we find um, different representatives that represent different sections of the population, correct? Right. Um, and different political faces that are associated with different political parties. So just purely from, I think, that politicking um, perspective, the figure of Jacob Zuma is ex extremely important to the MK party. Also, if we bear in mind um, Jacob Zuma's personal history, his personal involvement, um, kind of his growth through the MK as well. So it really speaks to um, a face giving to or giving voice um, possibly to people who feel that they have been marginalized throughout, um, you know, kind of the conduct of politics or throughout, throughout yeah. elections. So from that perspective, um, I would say the figure of Jacob Zuma is extremely important. All right. Um Professor Mgomizulu, before I go to digital audience, your take on that? 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, whether one likes it or not, like the president would say, will win the elections whether they like it or not. <laughs> so on this one, whether I like it or not, uh, uh, former President Zuma is a force to be reckoned with. Mm. One is a charismatic leader, two is closer to the people, and three, he understands some cultural practices which then endears him to the majority of South Africans. I've had people uh, advancing the view that uh, uh, former President Zuma is only popular uh, in KZN, which is absolutely wrong. Uh, you might have seen that when MK goes to other provinces, you find um, a similar excitement about the MK party. And then, of course, people will, will dismiss that and say, no, but the numbers are not that great. I'm not a fan of numbers like Mr. Kolo. Uh, Kabash is arguing from a legal perspective, but I'm not one person who is excited about numbers. As I said, with the uh, people feeling my Peter state, I'm saying, no, you can't just count on that and say, you've got the votes, because they, those people still have to vote, and you don't know how they're going to vote. Wow. So, but the, the short answer is that, uh, Former President Zuma is indeed a force to be reckoned with, which is the reason why of all the new political parties, the MK party is the one that is getting so much airtime mm. to the extent that even the governing party ends up unwittingly canvassing for MK at the expense of for their own party and then scoring own goals in the process. So in other words, yeah. uh, the, the emergence of MK with uh, former President Zuma in the face has in fact uh, left people mesmerized. Some don't even know what to say and they're scoring more goals. All right, let's go to our digital audience. I see hands up already. Howard, then Letitia. Howard, first to you. Good, Good evening. Uh, can I confirm that I'm audible? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Now, I've got the question regarding, as you say this first, uh, the ICJ's decision was a harsh one, however, a very necessary one for the sake of the rule of law. So now, given that the, the former president has got a huge uh, political influence in this country, and we are reluctant that perhaps we might even see uh, a, a, a bit of lack of acceptance regarding the decision, and even after the court may take a decision. So given that aspect, uh, and in terms of the influence of the former president, how can we best assure that uh, the supporters of MK will not now uh, do the same as what happened in July 2021 after uh, the decision of the Commission and the, and the Constitutional Court regarding the sentence that we have now. And perhaps this can be uh, given to either Mr. Mgomezul or Mr. Tulu in terms of answering that question. And the second one is, how much of a bearing would that decision, the 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 fifty month sentence, how much would of a bearing will it have if it were to be used as a defense or as part of the arguments in court? Thank you. All right, let's get the first one uh, to Professor Gomez Zulu uh, with regards to how do you think the supporters of the former president, as well as the MK party, should be processing or are processing the news that uh, he there's this objection and that objection was sustained by the IEC. No, thank you very much for the question. I think Howard is posing a very critical question. And I like his statement that uh, when the, uh, the, 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 our court uh, uh, passed this judgment, it was harsh, but then they also say it was necessary in order to make sure that uh, we balance things. Because, of course, we cannot just let things go. But uh, the manner in which everything was handled was totally wrong. So what the MK then uh, is doing right now is trying to reflect on that. Of course, it's too late now. Had they joined me at that time, because I'm one of the people, in fact, who stood by my statement at the time that uh, Zondo was wrong, the ICJ was wrong, and there are a number of people who, who, who brought us here. So then right now the MK is faced with very few options. The only option they have right now is to go to the uh, electoral court and then try to argue their case there. But they cannot use the old uh, the decision that was taken, the wrong decision that was taken, and then bring it here. So as to how they'll maneuver this, we can just wait for the legal team as to how they craft their argument in court, and then with the understanding that they are going to be listened to. But the reality is that on the issue of violence, we cannot rule that, uh, that one out. And in fact, I've, I've, I've done a couple of interviews where I raised concerns when this issue first emerged that uh, people, some people were saying that uh, well, if MK does not participate in the election, there would be no election to start mm. off with. 
And if a former President Zuma is not allowed to be the president of the party, there will be no election. Of course, that was a concerning statement. But what concerned me even more was when the president immediately talked about this in the media to the extent of saying that the, the soldiers are red. You don't do that. If you are the president of the country, you study the situation objectively, and whenever you make a statement, you make a firm statement. You don't respond to issues as they come, because there is a spokesperson who can do that, Mr. Vincent Makovanya. Mm. So I would say that uh, we cannot rule out the possibility of violence. But my fear is that uh, with statements saying that bring the soldiers to deal with the situation, then of course you might see more blood blood. Uh, than we saw uh, in 2021. So this is a cause for concern. And as to who will be to blame for this, you'll be the guest. Mm. <laughs> Let's uh, throw, well, I won't throw that to you, Mr. Kolu, but uh, pick up on the question that Howard had uh, regarding the 15 month, um, you know, the 15 month sentence as a defense. Um, at this point, as Lagat Laga has said, it's way too late. If maybe in 2021 the, um, the sentence was appealed, then section one, uh, section 46, subsection one, paragraph E will apply because if you read into that section, it says that this qualification does not apply if at the time when the sentence has been handed out, we are appealing or the process to appeal has not expired. Mm. Now it's almost uh, what three years later. So I think the 15 months uh, defense will probably not uh, apply as in, in this at this moment like i said in the beginning um what mk has been raising more especially in the media but we don't know what the legal strategy will be beyond mm -hmm. that is that they will fight for a, a, a two-thirds majority but in terms of the 15 months sentences like, like i say it's too late for that unless there's some other strategy that the, the lawyers will have uh, Jolene Kotsa, before I go to Letitia, I just need to uh, get your take on this uh, with regards to the potential or a potential of, of violence uh, in the lead up to the elections. How should that be processed? How should we be thinking about that? You know, I think, um, you know, with, with uh, my research focus very much on questions around democracy, mm. citizenship, uh, belonging and all of those um, interesting questions that drives politics. Um, the, the question of political violence and political instability, I think we are at a particularly sensitive time in our democratic history. Um, that, that would be my first point. But I just want to extend this argument a bit further um, and just say, you know, we also need to bear in mind how the political narrative is going to be received by the broader electorate. We are already in a situation where people, um, ordinary citizens are increasingly disillusioned with yeah. politics, increasingly disillusioned with their political representatives. Levels of political trust is at an all time low, both in politicians as well as institutions. Um, and I do feel that there is a responsibility on all actors, on political parties, to really try and navigate um, those threats of, of violence and, you know, saying that there won't be an election vis-a-vis -vis the soldiers already, you know, that very strong narrative. <clears throat> um, in the public imagination, because ultimately, as we saw in 2021, People voted, but they voted with their feet by staying away from the polls. Um, you know, so we also need to bear in mind that we do want broad political participation right. in this election right. and do need to pay attention to our political narratives. Right. I mean, apathy is something that we don't want as well. That's why a show like uh, today's show in helping us understand in terms of the process of the electoral system and the consequences of such decisions is very important. I need to take a quick break. When we come back straight to digital audience, stay with us. Welcome back. Time is off the essence. You're watching It's Topical. Uh, we're understanding the process with regards to the objections and what sort of decisions were made and the implications thereof. Uh, so it's important. Let's go to our digital audience straight up. Hands up all round. Letitia, I promise to get to you first. Go to you. 
Thank you, Blaine, and good evening, everyone. Um, so this is a very unfortunate situation, given that Jacob Zuma was the former president of the country and he fought for the freedom of the country. So his contributions are well noted, but it's also important to state that a crime has been committed. And unfortunately, there's consequences for all of our actions. As you stated earlier, Section 47 clearly states that if you've been convicted of a criminal, of a crime rather, and you've been sentenced to 12 months or more than you have, you can't be a member of parliament. But I think as the professor has, have stated earlier, there's, there's more to it. I think the intention would be um, to ruffle some feathers. The intention would be to incite violence to a certain extent, to make people uncomfortable. So I think there's more to this. But I believe that the IEC has made a good decision because um, the law has to um, abide. Justice has to prevail. And unfortunately, that's what's on the ground. Mm. And I think it's also going to teach a lot of people to not to abide by the law. So those are my thoughts. All I right. think good decision by the IEC and... Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's hear from Mosa Betsy. If you can unmute. All right. Are you, are you battling? Uh, there we go. Go on. No, no, no. I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to the guests and the contributions and the insights that they have already shared. I have a couple of questions, mm. and the first question that I have is uh, perhaps from a legal perspective on what crimes could former President Jacob Zuma and the NK party challenge the decision of the IEC at the Electoral Court? Uh, furthermore, should the court rule in, in his favor, what would be the implications of such a decision concerning the verdict issued by the Constitutional Court against them in 2021? Uh, the second question that I have is, amidst uh, pervasive misinformation, how can efforts be directed towards addressing concerns or controversies that surround the IEC's decision, while concurrently bolstering public understanding of electoral processes and the rule of law? And in addition to this, how can media which is supposed to be the fourth arm of government, responsibly report on IEC decision and its implications while mitigating the spread of misinformation or biased narratives. All right, Mr. Betsy, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we will get some answers for you in a short while. Let's go to Mbasa. Uh, Mbasa, let's hear from you. Okay, thank you, Plain. Uh, good evening to yourself and uh, the viewers at home. Well, um, I have uh, two comments or questions. Um, so, well, one is to first acknowledge that uh, the former president, Jacob Zuma, commands quite uh, a wide support. He has political clout, he's very influential, and he has quite a huge following in the country. And this ruling by the IEC in one way or the other, it does work to the benefit of the governing party because when we look at the, at, at, uh, the MK party's performance, in uh, the by-elections this year, we can see that it was clearly eating the lunch of um, the, the, the ANC and the EFF as well within, within KZN. However, I want to uh, bring our attention to the accident that happened on the 28th of March that was involving the former president, Jacob Zuma, and how that accident uh, that happened the day before the Easter weekend was used by uh, the spokesperson of the party to create this narrative that um, this, this kind of theory that the president is a target, mm. a target by the NC of Ramaphosa, a target of a white monopoly capital, and that there's a hit out on his life. And um, Begitele and Begim Tolo um, have something to do with that. Now, I just, just, I just want to right. ask Prof. Mkompezulu and uh, uh, Jolene uh, uh, about what is the danger of this kind of narrative as we head towards the elections on the 29th of May. All right, I know Professor Mgomizulu has to leave in about five minutes time, so I want to get your take on this, Prof, and then we'll go to Jolene. Uh, Prof, to you first. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Blaine, and thank you very much for the question, uh, Mr. Wilson. Go on, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I don't know what went wrong on my side. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I was saying thank you very much for the question. If we start with the last question on the accident, in fact, we have to do everything possible 
uh, to make sure that we address this accident as speedily as possible. Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, a strategy like this has been used in other countries. I was in Kenya in 2002 when the same strategy was used uh, against uh, 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 Mwai Kibaki, who became the president. Mm. Can you still hear me, Blake? Yes, go on. Loud okay. okay. Yeah, I was, in, I was there in Kenya. So just before the, the conclusion of um, the campaign period, uh, there was a fluke accident where a truck uh, just went straight to the convoy and then was sent to the ditch. And in his inauguration, which I attended at Uhuru Park, he had to be uh, had flown in from the UK uh, with the plasters all over the body and was shown sitting simply because there was, there was an attempt to eliminate him. So given that context, then we cannot um, simply rule it out in our context, even though it has never happened before. There is always first time. So the first thing that needs to happen then is that uh, everything must be done to investigate this case properly not to do like what we did with the Senzo Mewa case, when we just keep moving um, uh, around the case instead of uh, addressing the case directly. So that is how I can respond to that. I can only share uh, the, the, the view that uh, uh, JZ, in fact, has a political cloud, as my brother has been saying. Mm. That is, is absolutely true, it's factually correct. No one can dispute that. Even those who do so, they do that for their own political ends. Otherwise, the reality points to the opposite direction. Then the last, the last one uh, with regards to uh, Leticia, uh, when she makes the point that the crime has been committed, let's hypothetically say that yes, a crime was committed. Now, which section did we use to pass the judgment? Because if I remember well, uh, the act that was passed in 1947 is clear. If we're in contempt of um, um, uh, 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 someone's, you are fined in two ways. One, you are either fined 50 pounds or you are sentenced to a maximum of six months. I don't know then how uh, this judgment came to 15 months. And then, of course, at one point, it was uh, two years. So it means this uh, the number of months was thumbsacked. It was not uh, premised in law. Maybe uh, Mr. Kabash and Mr. Kodo will have a different opinion. But as far as I'm concerned, the 15 months was thumbsacked. It was not based in law. Mm. And then as to how the MK should rule, uh, I mean, should uh, work on this matter, and should the court rule in, his, in the MK's favor, what would that mean? One, it would mean that uh, they will have looked at the um, at, um, arguments presented by the MK lawyers. If they find those arguments convincing, which we don't know at the moment what those arguments would be, given the point that Mr. Kabashi just said that uh, we've run out of time. But then it will depend. Then if they rule in, in his favor mm. or in MK's favor, then it's fine, uh, well and good, then we'll avoid all the other things we've been talking about. Prof, I know you have to leave. We really appreciate your thoughts on this matter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Blaine, and thank you very much to my colleagues, and thank you to the viewers. Jolene, let's uh, pick up where the prof left off. Your thoughts on his thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> uh, big shoes to fill <laughs> um, under pressure. <laughs> so, but I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my reflections off by just saying that we have to bear in mind again, we are in a post-COVID world, right? Mm. Um, and we are living in what some scholars are starting to term the age of political synonymism. Mm. Um, we don't trust anybody. We don't trust any, any of our institutions. We don't trust our politicians. We are just cynical citizens. Um, and I think for me, the greatest example of that is what we saw uh, with the U.S. elections on the storming of Capitol Hill. Um, and bearing in mind that the U.S. was often upheld kind of as the beacon of, of what a representative democracy should look like. Um, I think in, the, in our particular case and the questions that we are dealing with now, for me now than ever, I think we, those questions around what are the values of political mm. elite, um, what are the barometers by which we measure responsible political engagement, responsible politicking, um, bearing in mind mm. we could very well end up, and, and I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate, right. we could very well end up in a situation where the ANC, the MK, um, and the EFF, for argument's sake, may need to work together in a coalition situation. Mm, mm. And, you know, this, this type of... of um, I want to say political intolerant politicking right. um, does not bode well.
for that institutional stability that needs to happen after the elections. All right. Uh, let's get uh, Jabalani's thoughts and then we'll go to Amina. Jabalani first. Thank you so much, Blake, for the platform. Well, I think as South Africans, we need to approach this whole entire matter from a theoretical perspective. I mean, one of the great, one of the indicators of a great democracy is political competition. So mm. if the majority is saying that President Jacob Zuma should be on that ballot, then I think we should adhere to that. I mean, and the NC should stop using the IEC for their own political agenda or whatever is it that they have against Zuma. I mean, if they administer this country properly, they wouldn't be in fear of Mm. The, 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 the storm that's, that, that the MK is currently cooking, you know. So they need to be on their A game so that when such time comes, there's no need for political manipulations and whatever, whatever is it that they are pushing, you know. And I think mm. this is why as a scholar of political sciences, I hate law so much because it's kind of limiting in terms of how we can <laughs> contextualize or articulate a matter, you know. The right. constitution shouldn't be above what the majority is saying. If majority is saying this, then we should adhere to the majority because the people makes up the constitution. Mm. And thank you so much for that form, Interesting take. Uh, we'll get Mr. Kulu's point in a short while. Uh, Hamina? Yes, um, thank you very much. And give good evening also to you all. Um, I have a question around um, the fears of violence during the elections and the possibility of a coalition um, as according to other analyst observations. And so in 2008, um, there were Kenyan elections where violence um, ensued between supporters of contesting um, Raila Odinga and his opponents, which led to a national um, crisis where the end uh, was a power sharing agreement between the two. Mm. So my question therefore is around the likelihood of a similar situation happening around these upcoming elections in South Africa. Can we expect violence um, in these elections and a possible um, currency and the, and the MK? And my question is partly because the MK spokesperson expressed that mm. um, the constitution could not supersede the will of the people. And my last question is, does the notion of no one is above the law still apply? And I'm asking this because there's been um, concerns about how the MK has been conducting themselves, especially um, with the notion that um, the will of the of, that the constitution could not supersede yeah. the will of the people, which others see as undermining the constitution of South Africa, which is the highest law of the right. land. Amanda, thank you very much indeed. I think uh, Jolene could uh, answered your question with regards to the violence partially, but we'll try to get some answers. But uh, I'm told we are fast running out of time. But I want to go to Mr. Kulu. Uh, let's pick up on Mr. Betsy's question, uh, Mr. Kulu, if you will, in terms of what grounds uh, can they possibly cha uh, challenge the IEC's decision? Um, I was just trying to think about it. Uh, right now i don't see what what strategy they have other than to say because if, if you heard them saying they've said you know the will of the people is that they will have uh, president zuma as the face of mk and for him to be a president so the only option that they have is outside of these processes between now and the and the 9th of april which is to get a two-thirds majority because let us look at section 27 subsection 2 paragraph b it says uh, the uh, authorized uh, representative of a party must make a declaration that all the candidates on the list, they qualify in terms of the constitution, the national legislation and the provincial legislation under chapter 27. So that takes us back to, to section 47. In, in this case, the ones that we've mentioned in particular, subsection 1 to paragraph E. The former president does not qualify. So mm -hmm. that is how he's, he's been constitutionally disqualified. So what and that despite, that's despite that's despite him not completing a full two terms, right? Yes, well, that's that's something else which he did not finish. Obviously, I did check that, but I think I want to focus on on the on the you know the the, the sentence because okay. it's the big pending issue. Yeah. yeah. All right. Your 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 final thoughts on that? We've got thirty seconds. Oh, well, my final thoughts is that obviously let's see what the MK will have on the 2nd of April. 
uh, what I've seen is that the president or the former president always, you know, makes us to think deep in terms of politics and law. Yeah. They are always in the so we don't know what he will use. But let's hope that there will be peace despite uh, uh, that, that, that result that we may get in these elections, because that's the most important thing. Folks, we've got to go. <laughs> I'm being told that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, though, for your contributions, Jolene, as well. Uh, Mr. Kulu, uh, Melusik Kulu, uh, digital audience, also to Professor Mgomizulu. We appreciate the conversation, no doubt, continues, although we run out of time. Uh, but we'll have much more of these conversations going forward. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. All right, before we go, here's my take. For many, Easter is a time of renewal, it's a time of rebirth, it's a time of hope, right? The act of doing what is right and being truthful, uh, a manifestation of the, the aspiration of something better above us, watching with approval. It also plays into current affairs. Those who have made the cut to contest the upcoming elections, do you expect them to be a a model of rectitude, right? Embodying morally correct behavior or thinking. Is that what attracts you to a candidate? Or is it based on the work they do perhaps? Or is it a bit of both and a whole lot of something else? That is exactly what we're hoping to understand during It's Topical, which by the way, we're turning two years old this week, Hibet Hooray, uh, and also Elections 360, which starts in two weeks' time. We want to understand where your, your head and your heart are ahead of the May 29th poll. During Easter, we are also reminded to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. You don't want to, to feed animus, right? You want to dispel it, especially during this heated election period. You heard what some of the comments brought up tonight. The end goal needs to be an uplifted community. Communities that have the basics, water, electricity, roads, roads without potholes. Look, in politics, there's ample ambition, right? Hopefully, there's principle too. And it is my sincere hope, and I'm sure it's yours as well, that principle outweighs ambition. We shall see, yes, three of the most loaded words in politics. That's my take. If you miss anything on this program, be sure to watch It's Topical on YouTube. Sports Live up next. If you're watching a repeat of this program, then as always, the news continues. Until next week, my brothers and sisters, take care. Bye-bye.